Can I ask you, Anne, what was some maybe perceptions that have changed with regard to the 16th century? Um, now, from your research and your uh, experience and performance, like what are things that were maybe incorrect before that we that we now have revised? That solemnization is relevant. <laughs> so it wasn't considered re relevant before? No, no. Nobody was teaching it. Uh, and, 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 and because it was just considered to be some sort of sight singing exercise. And by the time one got to any institution, one knew how to sight sing. So therefore, solemnization was irrelevant. Wow. Oh. And, 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 it's something that I still on occasion meet today. The conception that uh, polyphony is abstract ethereal music was very much in existence. And therefore it had to be performed very regularly and without emotion and, and you just enjoyed it for the pure beauty of the music. Um, for me, that was the greatest thing because I kept on trying to bring things in from my reading into performance and I kept on being told that I was wrong. Um, I was told that the trills didn't exist in the 16th century. Okay. That's, that was the um, perception. Um, okay. And, and so it, it, there was this idealization of this music somewhat similar to Stravinsky's idea that all you do is perform the music or Bach, you know, the, the source of the idea of all of these Ortex editions is that first of all, you make a, a good proper edition and then you only play what's in the edition and you don't do anything else. Mm. And um, Partimento, solmization, um, what else belongs in this category? Um, uh, Contrapontamente, all of these different forms of improvisation and, and teaching of composition are subjects that you do not find in the big theoretical sources of the 16th century and earlier. You don't, you don't find discussion of solmization in, in Sarlino. You don't find it in Gladion. Uh, you find it in his small books, but you don't find it in his and big books. And why was that? Did they just feel like this is so ubiquitous, we don't need to discuss it? Maybe it was that, or maybe it was the secret technique or a skill that you had as a musician that you hid from other people. Or maybe, on the other hand, the big books were not meant at a low level at all, they were more meant, meant to show that one's a, a, a good musician. Right. And, and, and so the things that one learned at the very earliest age that a choir boy would learn, the first thing that he would learn would be the hand and, and, and how to sing with the hand. And the next thing that he would learn after that would be to sing uh, melodic uh, thirds, ut mi re fa, and and doing these things. The next thing he would be learning would be counterpoint from it, also based on the hand and knowing where it is. Uh, and I have come to the realization since writing this book that uh, the hand is one of the most important aspects of this whole thing oh, this is the uh, greatest thing i've ever heard <laughs> um, oh. i had a student i had a student who came to the scola and took one year of solmization and at the same time she was taking ear training and at, and at the end of the year she took an ear training exam and she asked the teacher am i allowed to use my hand and of course he said yes and he said she then said it was absolutely ridiculous. It was if I had a piano in the hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this is really what I've learned, that you, you learn to put the pitches into your hand so you really know where they are. And, and it's a way of 
navigating the tonal system. 